Hey there, Hannah, I'm in. Hi, Jill. We'll get started here in a few minutes. Uh, sorry about that. I, I saw your note come in, but I used the one from the calendar invite, which clearly was not the correct one. So thank you. <laughs> great. Also, we're currently live on YouTube. Oh, great. Uh -huh. Hello everyone. Um, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, thank you for joining us today for a chat with a few of Schmidt Ocean Institute's ROV pilots and technicians. My name is Hannah Nolan and I'm on the communications team uh, for the Schmidt Ocean Institute. We're excited to be hosting this conversation with participants in the MATE ROV competition. Uh, before we get started, just a little bit of housekeeping. We love participation from all of you watching. Please uh, feel free to ask questions. If you're participating in the Zoom webinar, you can do through the, um, so through the Q&A box. Uh, and if you're watching on YouTube, you can always ask questions in the chat bar to your right. Uh, we will be monitoring both throughout the chat. Um, to get things rolling, just a little bit of background. The Schmidt Institute was established in 2009 and strives to advance the frontiers of ocean research and exploration through technological 
innovation, operational support, and open sharing of information. Along with the ship RV Falcor, our ROV Sebastian became a part of our resources in 2016 and was specifically de designed for scientific research. One of the ways SOA seeks to raise awareness and inspire people is through live streaming all of our ROV dives. We are currently on an expedition in the northern depths of the Great Barrier Reef, and our science team and crew recently observed a Dumbo octopus exhibiting um, previously unseen behavior. You can check that out on our social media. Our pilots are pivotal for this work and our trained specialists who have been working in the field for years. Uh, now, I'd love to introduce you to our guests of honor currently joining us from the waters off the east coast of Australia, uh, J-Rod and Cody. We'll wait for you. Yeah. Hi, guys. Uh, you are currently on mute, so if uh, you can, I'm going to ask you to unmute. Um, you're still on mute, guys. Oh. There you are. Hello. Hello. Hello, everyone. <laughs> uh, so, J-Rod and Cody, could you start us off by telling us a little bit about yourselves and the current expedition? Hi, I'm Jason Rodriguez. Everybody calls me J-Rod on board. Um, I'm from Houston, Texas. Uh, I currently live in Austin, Texas now. Um, I've been working with Schmidt since 2017. Um, been doing ROVs for about 10 years. And I am Cody Perez. I'm from Houston, Texas as well, residing in Folster, Texas. I've been doing ROVs for nine years now. And I started with SOI in 2016 when Sebastian got on board. Awesome, thank you. Uh, what are you all doing? Like, where are you right now? Uh, what's going on on Falcor? We are currently mapping um, an area of the Great Barrier Reef. Um, currently, the reef is out off this direction. Um, we're going to be doing lines back and forth, um, mapping out an area to get a proposed dive site for tomorrow morning. Awesome. Um, that is very cool. So uh, what do you think this, uh, what is this dive site that you are all gonna be mapping tomorrow or sorry, diving on tomorrow? Um, there's multiple areas. Um, we have like three different options. I can't remember the actual name of the canyon that we will be diving in. Di Diamond Reef? Diamond Reef. Diamond. Um, I know it will be down to about 1,500 meters um, this time, and um, we'll be looking for the biodiversity going on and looking at the different um, geology that's going on. See? Cool. Um, what might be a challenge you could potentially encounter during this dive? You want to go over this one? Yeah, yeah. One of the main challenges that we'll be uh, facing is the East Australian current. So we got this current that's coming Hey, where are we right here? So it'll probably be coming this way, right? Uh, no, it branches off. It'll be going that way. Okay. Oh, going that way. Mm -hmm. So it'll be going that way, and it's going up to two to three knots of current, and that goes down all the way almost to 300 meters or so. Correct. From almost to surface. So yeah, it's a pretty three feet of current. We've got to plow through, get down to 1,200, 1,500 meters. And with that being said, you know, if we are coming up shallow, we're going to have our umbilical with our floats that are going to be in the current itself. And uh, that's not really good for positioning with the ROV. So that's one of the big, big issues we'll be facing tomorrow once we do dive. And wow. last, uh, last cruise, we were down further south and we had the same current hitting us from the top and then our um, Antarctic blast yeah. coming, coming from, below. from below. So you had currents crossing each other. So as you're going down, you're hitting those higher currents at the top yep. and then for like 50 meters you'd just be a lull of no current and then as soon as you went past that it was the exact same current pushing the other direction which normally we can operate if we can get through the heavy current and get down to the half a knot current land mm -hmm. we're fine but in those areas we were getting over a knot and a half all the way down to the bottom which is very hard to stay stable and pilot sebastian as you can tell it's not 
doesn't have all four thrusters in the, on the ROV itself. It only has two axial thrusters in the aft. That's amazing. Um, so currently we aren't having any questions come in from our participants. If you are currently watching right now and you have any questions for J-Rod or Cody, uh, I will happily pass them along for you. Um, there's a Q&A box, there's also the chat box in the Zoom, and then on the YouTube, there's the chat bar to the side. Um, so beyond the challenges of the Antarctic current and the East Australian current, when you're kind of coming up against these currents, uh, how, what is sort of your strategy uh, for managing these tough situations? Um, well, before the dive, we're in contact with the uh principal investigator, chief scientist, the lead MT, um, the bridge, and we're looking at all the winds on the surface, the surface currents, making sure that the vessel is going to have a good setup for us to be able to go along the route that the principal investigator would like us to, to look at. And if that's not working, we have to make a quick change on the fly because if the vessel is not in a situation to where they'll be in deeper water and if something goes wrong, the vessel can't pull away and drag us out to safety. If they're in shallower water and something goes wrong, they'll actually pull us over this, these beautiful reefs and that would just be horrible. And then let's say we do, we do end up diving, so the currents are manageable. The, the main figure when you're piloting is you're gonna wanna put your, your nose or, or your back end of the ROV into the current. You don't wanna go sideways broadside, nailed by this current and being pushed constantly going to be difficult for the guys because here that they're in will latch the umbilical put some floats that are right behind j-rod and the cameraman here will latch these floats onto the umbilical and if the current is strong and pushing let's say us towards starboard hard starboard that umbilical is getting yanked as well so you got to want to face into this current try to hold it so they can get the floats on and as soon as we get all the floats on all 12 floats or diving down and get out of the current. Wow. Use the floats to as a uh, catenary system. So it keeps our umbilical up and out of the way. So it makes a big figure S. Yep, there we go. Just like this. Just like that. So ROV's <laughs> here. Let's say ROV's my leg. There's your umbilical. It's going to keep that umbilical up and out of the way and keep some of the spring. It's there. Yep, and it's gonna keep that spring out. So when the ship's bobbing and moving, or sub C, that umbil that ROV stands still. It helps when it comes to currents as well. Instead of having a nice tight current and those floats getting hit by the current, mm -hmm. all loose. It's figure S in the water column. That's really cool. So we do have some questions coming in from our participants. Uh, someone, uh, Matthew asked, how did you two get started in ROVs? You wanna go first? Or? Yeah, I'll go first. So I got started uh, right, out of, right out of high school, actually. I was um, 19 at the time and I started in the oil field. I uh, worked for a company based out of Perth, Australia called TMT and uh, did a lot of rig support, did a lot of offshore drilling, um, did a bunch of dive support. And um, just recently, like I said, in 2016, that's when I started with SOI and you know, pretty much opened up my eyes to the science world of doing ROVs and I've been doing it in the science industry since 2016? Uh, for me, it was a little bit longer of a journey. Um, growing up, uh, my mom uh, signed up for the HUD program and moved me out into the suburbs and got me into the ability to be able to get into college. Um, college didn't work out so well for me, so I joined the military and uh, I had pretty high scores um, technology and they put me into aviation electronics. And um, not only was I a technician, but I was also an operator in the Navy. So I got to fly on the plane that I got to fix and gave me the, the skills to be able to work with my hands and operate and learn if you break it, you have to fix it kind of a scenario. And after serving for eight years in the Navy, I got out and um, tumbled into the ROV industry and um, working in oil and gas like Cody did for about seven years. And luckily I got the call to come over to Schmidt, which has been much more fulfilling than oil and gas aspect of it. Wow. Um, do you need a special education to uh, have to um, do this job? 
I'd say not at all. As long as you're, you can take criticism and you can uh, work hard and really, really I guess, soak in the knowledge from other pilots, other sonorities, you can excel extremely fast in this industry. Um, obviously, don't you, you want to stay on your toes a lot. You, this, this industry is constantly moving. You know, there's new technology that's coming out left and right. And uh, you want to you want to stay on your toes when it comes to that. You, there's always something new to learn, as you know, we, we yeah. could tell coming from oil field to yeah. science. You know, this was especially built ROV for science, and we're used to I guess you could call them tailor made or you know, factory made ROVs, to where there's one manual for two ROVs, and everybody knows them. To where this is something special, and you got you got to really learn and certain aspects of this ROV. Right. Uh, it's, you can't just have one discipline either. You can't just go to school and just learn electronics and that's going to be all you need to know to be into ROV. It's a good thing to have a discipline, something that you find as what you're the best at, but you have to be open to the other um, systems like hydraulics, mechanical, um, electrical, which, of course, there's a difference between electrical and electronic. Um, and, optic network. Yeah. And you'll start learning how all these systems work a lot the same, and troubleshooting works the same. A leak in hydraulics is the same as a leak in electronics, and they all cause major issues, and it's just a different way of locating them. And so, keeping your mind open and getting knowledge from anybody you can. And once you find somebody who's doing something you've never done before, jump in. Jump in. You don't have to be an expert on it. You just have to have an idea of how things work. Exactly. And, and the ability to want to take things apart and put them back together and all that kind of stuff. I like to always say you need to be a renaissance man or woman that used yep. to be a term for somebody who was a jack of all trades. Um, a master of none and it's it's definitely true with ROVs a lot of it's on the job training so you play it off with each other left and right you know J-Rod has stronger suits than I would and you know vice versa and even for the other techs they have different knowledge in different industries that aren't just ROVs and they bring it over to ROVs which actually helps out a lot as you got you know our winch for example it has a full PLC system that we might not be trained in a PLC system, but we have a guy that worked on PLC systems that built PLC systems that might come on board and be like, hey, you know, oh yeah, I know this. This is what you do here, this is what you do there. Instead of just looking at the manual, you got someone that actually, you know, possibly could have built a system like PLC and it's teaching you this is how this operates in a way. Um, Always good. What does PLC stand for, Cody? Uh, can you hear me, Cody? I oh, remember. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. Yes. Logic controller. That yeah. is right. Power logic controller. Power logic controller. Cool. Um, so Daniel asks, do you collect specimens on the dives? Yes, we do. We All actually time. do. So you'll see Sebastian you has uh, two here. manipulators. Um, this is our port uh, T4. Um, this just has our regular jaws on it. Um, these are good for picking up rocks. Um, anything bigger, um, we could pick up small things with it, um, but we'd more use that arm for it. Um, that has the coral cutters on it. So you'll see it has a soft tube right here. And when Cody squeezes all the way in, it's not going to hurt me. Um, but this right here is like a cleaver, which can cut the coral. And then we get a soft grab of it. And then we can then easily stow it into one of the bio boxes. And these are set up, currently this one's set up in a quad, so we can put four different samples in this one. This one is a full cube, so much bigger. And the one in the back has, it's just one massive one with two different lids. Um, so that allows us to take a multiple different type of samples, whether it's rock, coral, um, other little squiggly things, um, and they are sealed to where they will try and keep the water temperature as close as possible of where we took the sample at. So when we bring it on deck, it has the best chance for the scientists to get the data that they need out of it. Um, these are 
Core tubes, Cody, you wanna explain the core tube? So the core tube, what we'll do is um, obviously T4 will come over, grab the, the core tube. Up here, if you see right there, there's a little valve. That valve, right when you pull it off, shuts. You start putting it into the ground, this is the water through this valve. As it go all the way down, let's say we want our mud right there, our sediment. This valve will completely come in, pull up, create a suction. It's creating the suction. Now, sometimes when we do go down, the whole thing will be suctioned down to the ground, and you'll have to break it free by wiggling it, try to get that suction broken from the bottom side. Once you pull it up, got your sediment sample there. Not fall out because it already created a vacuum in here. And we'll come over, put it in the air, nice tip tap, and, and it goes. And then we bring it up top, and scientists will break it apart, start taking layers out, the different sediments and the different properties of those sediments. And it, it, it depends. Oh, yeah, that's right, that's right. I can't hear you. So it really depends on how hard it is to push down those core tubes. Um, the, the sediment itself, we don't have a haptic feedback on these arms. So when we go in, it's all by touch, feel, and sight. So we're going in and you can see that, yeah, you might be hitting the uh, ground and it's extremely soft and goes in nice and easy, or we'll have some clay, rock, push it down and it's a little, it's a little hard. So it all depends on where we're at. And huh. over here, we have our suction sampler. This itself, we use its big subsea vacuum pretty much. Get a little critter, we'll get a jelly or fish or whatever the scientists want to sample. Crank this up, has an impeller in there, start sucking in some water. That animal, creature, coral will come through, travel up this tube into the actual carousel, and then it will come out on one of the jars that Jay Rod just pulled out here. So each jar has a mesh on top. This is a fine mesh that we have. That way, anything that's really, really small, which we catch a lot of really small things in here, it won't fly out. Now, if we didn't have the small mesh, they'll obviously go through that first grading. Um, it all depends on what the scientists want. If they are hunting over for little, little small creatures or big creatures, well, you know, obviously the big creatures are gonna be heavier. So we'll need more suction take that fine mesh out because it'll constrict the actual heat of the suction and then um, likewise with the fine mesh so it's all it all depends what the scientists want and need that's awesome um uh pamela asks have you found any critters attached to the rov when pulled up out of the ocean <laughs> quite a few times so funny yeah. story i'm gonna <laughs> what, what fish was it the uh, it was a lizard fish a lizard fish so john if you want to follow me back here it was what time at night nine ten o'clock yeah it was late it, it was late me and j-rod we uh we tend to work together a lot and uh it was late at night imagine out here completely dark in here if you want to come over here john right here there's some velcro there's this thing called a lizard fish, and it was in Western Australia. This thing looked wicked. It, it had a million teeth. A million teeth. It it looked ferocious. And when we do a when we do a dive and get on onto deck, we have to do a post dive check. So Jared's sitting there checking everything, make sure there's no leaks, make sure the oil looks good. I'm sitting here. I'm over there. I hear a little scream and a jump back. There's this lizard fish. Manly scream. Man manly scream. <laughs> There's this lizard fish that's inside the ROV staring at him and with a million teeth. And it, it was just, it was wicked looking. We had to bring it up from, it had to be deep. That was a deep fish. Yeah, it was deep. Just, yeah. just you could tell by the eyes, I guess you could say. Um, it was it was very deep. That's awesome. But yeah, we, we do catch a, do get a lot of things on the ROV. Jellies, conifers. So we have to be very careful sometimes when, we are coming up because there is things that can sting you down there, and especially here in Australia, we all know there's a bunch of things that can come after you. Um, you're after on the ROV, and you got to spray it down before you can actually get your hands on it. So that is really cool. Um, Thomas asks, how long did it take to learn how to operate the ROV, or Sebastian specifically? 
Um, for me, um, when I got into the industry, um, you started off operating this puppy right here for about a year. Your job was to operate the winch and as the pilots and the co-pilots were in there working, your job was to sit out here in the sun and pay out and pay in and pay out and pay in and work on the deck and do the daily maintenance and learn the ROV and how it all works before you even got a chance to start flying. And it was to build your um, foundation on what you're working with and how expensive it is and how hard it is to repair and to let you know once you start flying that little mistakes cost a lot of money. So um, after about a year of doing that, then I got to go inside the control room and I was only able to co-pilot for about another six months. After that, then I slowly started getting some time on um, low priority jobs to do some piloting, bringing it up, bringing it down, little runs to disconnect something from the crane. And eventually I got more experience, more confident, and then I became a pilot uh, pretty much all the time. And then once you have a crew of no trainees, then you're just all three just slopping around and getting better on your skills in all the different positions. Mine, mine was about the same. Um, you know, I started out, I was a trainee, was young, young trainee at the time. And uh, yeah, I wasn't allowed to fly. I wasn't allowed in the control room until the first, you know, year. And that's, that was the reality of it. And, you know, it taught me uh, to, to respect the equipment, to respect, like, you know, years and to move up and gradually climb that ladder. Now, you know, it's after doing it for so long, Piloting just becomes natural to you, and you start yeah. to sit there. You're watching for mistakes. You're constantly feeding off of each other. Mm. Uh, Sebastian, in particular, is a little different. It flies different than any other ROV, just due to the fact that we only have two axials, have two verticals, and we have a lateral thruster. Some of the commercial ROVs do not have a lateral thruster. It has four axials. And um, yeah, it's just, it's, it's a completely different experience flying this one compared to a commercial vehicle like a mm. Perry or a uh, UHD, which is Schilling. Uh, There's a big reason why our system is like that though. Yes. It does hinder us for rough weather operations and high currents. But when we're looking at jellyfish that are about that big, about this close to the ROV, trying to get 4K footage, of it using that camera that John's showing you right now. If we were to have the normal thrusters right here, any little move that we made forward, backwards, or heading correction would put a prop wash, wash right here and just um, mess up the all the imagery of the jellyfish. Actually, that segues into another great question. Uh, Justin on YouTube asked, last dive when we were looking at the Dumbo octopus, it occurred to me that it must be very difficult to track a floating creature like that especially with the currents, how do you do it? Yes, um, as Cody was mentioning early before, um, if you have Sebastian broadside to a current, it's like a big wall. So that current is hitting us significantly harder than it's hitting a jellyfish that's designed to float through the water. Yep. So we start moving at a faster pace than the jellyfish. So we actually have to find a ideal heading that's safe for us and the vessel setup be able to float with it at best we can so that we're not throwing too much prop wash towards the animal. Uh, if none, if possible, we want absolute none. And then all we have to do is just really manage our um, elevation. Or and it, as you can tell, when we, when we were flying around it, at the beginning, there was a little prop wash, a little bit of the current that was hitting that gumbo. That's when we started to maneuver and get into a good position. That's when we started getting that good video. Yeah, there's a little bit of bobbing and weaving. That's because we're zoomed in on said creature. We don't want to be too close to it. We don't want it to come into the ROV. We want to stay at a certain distance, especially dealing with a, you know, an octopus. And we don't, we don't know what the octopus was actually doing or what it had inside of them. Yeah. So, you know, we wanted to stay at a good distance and just keep an eye on it. And that's why there's just ever so slightly a little bobbing and weaving just a little bit it's because we're zoomed in and we're trying to vertical and keep up with the animal that is definitely a, an impressive skill um <laughs> matthew asks uh what is the coolest system slash item slash thing on sebastian 
Oh, um, <laughs> I'm definitely, I'm definitely partial to the T4. T4. Uh, it's a, uh, it's significantly stronger than um, it looks. It can pick up a thousand pounds uh, straight up. You can get 250 pounds all the way out to where I'm at right now, which is about seven foot away from the ROV, and it can do that and manipulate 250 pounds all the way out. We can also pick up cup corals on the bottom of the ocean that we won't break, bring them up, and then the scientists accidentally break them when they take them out of the battle yeah. box because they are so fragile. So. We'll come. We'll we'll bring up an arm, but I would have to agree with J Rod. Definitely the T4, and then second would be the that 4K. The video cameras. Yeah. The the 4K camera itself. Um. What is like? Yeah, what right. makes the 4K camera so special? Uh, uh, hold on, real quick, Anna. We're about to do a T4 demonstration, real quick. Oh, great! Awesome. So we're gonna. Operate our starboard arm. Yeah, he he's fine. I know he knows what he's doing. He has he's just moving his camera over right now. Here we go. So the T4, we also give it a uh, nickname as a seven function. Um, we call it a seven function, of course, because it has seven different functions it can do. We have the wrist rotate, which it can rotate 360 degrees. Um, it can also do that at 150 foot-pounds of torque. Um, you have the jaw open and close, which has a crushing force of 900 foot-pounds, I believe. Yes. And you have the yaw function, which allows us to go in and out. You have a pitch function, which comes up and down. You have an elbow function, right? And then you have the shoulder, which is the ram. So you can shoulder up and down, which allows us to actually be able to pick stuff below Sebastian. And then we have an azimuth, which we'll refer to as a shoulder left or right. And that's um, all seven functions. This, this arm is actually designed to have two lights and a camera on it which actually gives us a little bit more of an advantage to be able to have a close-up image of what you're about to grab. So when he's rotated, rotate um, 90. Chris, rotate 90. All right, so when he opens up, he now has a perfect view of what he's going in to grab. Beautiful. First stoke. And then the 4K camera, Chris, when you're ready, um, the, what Cody was talking about, we actually have the ability to be able to bring it out to about right here. This, Want to explain? Yeah. This, this helps out when we're, um, let's say we do have this porch out. As you can see, we do have the porch out a little bit. This will help out with actually getting this out of view of the camera so we can get those nice shots. As well as when the porch is sucked in, this is all the way out. We're able to feel, get that, that feeling of being closer to the animal with not really being too close to the said creature. And that's when we, like the other day with the Dumbo octopus, this was all the way out. And you know, when it comes in, you obviously get your peripheral of the actual arms, but it's not too bad. You're good to close that back in, Chris. This is a 4K camera. It's made by Sulis, I believe. Yep. So it's a Sony Handycam that's 4K built around a uh, housing that can withstand 4,500 meters. That's amazing. Uh, um, you could kill it. Wow. I'm also learning so much about Sebastian right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Matthew also asked, are there any superstitious or good luck charms on Sebastian? <laughs> There's a lot that um, There's some a people lot. Have, have. Yeah, <laughs> we don't play music in the morning, <laughs> so that's one big no-no. No music in the morning. Yeah. Uh, you got to make sure you finish your coffee before you can touch the ROV. Um, with some with some other ones that we got. You got to turn the F beacon towards the ROV. Uh, yeah. You know, just just it's a, not on, John. 
Yeah, it's not on then. But, uh, you know, just some superstitions. You know, it's, we are at sea, and we like to play that role. But, no, we don't have any good luck charms. Obviously, we do have some some paintings up. Yeah. But uh, those, we don't we don't consider those lucky charms yet. You don't you never say this is going really really good. Never never <laughs> say this is going really really good. Oh, it's gonna be a, it's gonna be a great. Uh, it's going amazing. No, don't say that. But shut. Never. Sit there, look at each other, and nod. Never say the R word. Which is retermination. Return. Yeah, never, never say yeah. return. Return oh. is uh, one of the nightmares of being an ROV pilot. That's when. Um, cable that connects you to the vessel um, has an issue, whether it be got bent or one of your conductors um, got too hot due to current and um, gets a short to ground, whatever it may be, process of re-terminating it is a long process. You can do it faster, but it's very important, so it's better to take your time and do it right. Exactly. And it's this system, it takes about 12 hours to take your time and do it right. Yeah. You want to do it right. You want to take those steps and the precautions. And, you know, especially when you got someone on board that doesn't know how to do a return on this system, you obviously want to take your time slower. Teach them because if they're out here and you're not, have that knowledge of doing that return, something happens, then or we dive until you get that return going. I guess you could say we're we're a little bit superstitious. Yeah, yeah. There's certain things we do, certain things we do in certain orders. Awesome. Um, we had another question come in uh, from Addison. How much does Sebastian weigh? Thirty-two hundred kilograms. Is there something kind of analogous? Uh, to that, and kilograms? and. That 3,200 kilograms is in air. Um, as soon as Sebastian goes into the water, um, we're actually negative. Um, we actually, she floats. Yep. So um, that is due to uh, the foam block that John was just pointing out. Um, um, foam block is rated to be able to go down to depth. It's not your typical foam. It's a synthet synthetic foam, which is actually made up of millions of little glass um, spheres um, that doesn't compress as much as typical flotation would. And um, that's why we have all this rubber right here because it still will shrink a little bit and the flotation will kind of be moving just a little bit when we're subsea. Um, Cody was pointing out that behind all the artwork, we actually have the ability to slide um, flotation out. Um, and just, yeah, we can adjust our trim. Um, very modular so yeah. that way we can like like Jared said we could just trim and you know depending on where we're at in the world as well and the so the water I guess you could say yep um, will cause this to be heavier to be lighter all all depends be real quick how we have our modular flown box set up exactly and depending on like uh, John the cameraman was saying depending on Depending on what type of equipment is on Sebastian itself, we have um, scientists that will come up. That's which brings in another good point while Jared takes that off. We have an open deck system to where scientists can come in and put their equipment back here and we can stage it different parts of the ROV. Um, we had one job to where it was actually Sebastian's maiden voyage when we um, saw Sebastian for the first time in the Marianas Trench. We had Beast on here, which was a piece of science equipment that measured hydrothermal vent gases and helped store it and you know, the, the scientists can get it up when it comes to surface and it reads real time what's going on. He took over this, that side, and it was heavy. We put extra floats on. We had to latch floats here. We had to let, put floats in there because it was so heavy. And as you can see right now, we don't have very many floats in there. That's because currently, we don't have any of this extra gear in the back. All the main gear that we have is in the front of Sebastian. So the front is primarily full and the aft is not that way to keep the front of Sebastian pitched more up yep. or trying to be more pitched up. Nice. Any um, more questions? Yeah, Roy asked, how did Sebastian get its name? So Sebastian got its name from the movie never or movie slash book 
never ending story. Uh, obviously, the ship is called Falcor, Blood Dragon. And Sebastian is the, the little, boy, right? Yeah, yeah, the little boy. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't seen it. I haven't read it. Um, that, or, 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 no, or is the horse. Uh, oh, yeah, there is a horse. Uh, Atreyu, yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> Al asked, uh, kind of expand on that, are there any nicknames for Sebastian? Um, no, no, I, I mean, Sebastian, no, yeah, nothing really. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I mean, pretty much we only ever referred to Sebastian as either Sebastian or the ROV, yeah. but primarily Sebastian. Cool. Um, uh, would y'all like to see the control room? Yeah, we would love to see. Or, the control. or do you want to see some light skin turned on? Yeah, you would y'all like anything? to do a full pre-dive so you could see how we do a pre-dive and yeah. how everything works on Sebastian itself? Um, I'm going to ask... take questions as we go. Yeah. Uh, Jill, would you like to see the control room or would you like to see um, a pre-dive? Or maybe hmm, this might be a poll Both. situation. Yeah, it'd be great to take a, a poll. I'd like to see both, but you know, we could we could have those watch it raise their hand if they want the pre-dive versus uh, the control room. Okay, let me see if I can launch a poll. Um, I, a I think we have time for both. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a bit, the pre-dive is pretty quick. Yeah, we won't go through a quick. full on crazy one. Cool, let's do a pre-dive and then check out the control room. All right, let's do it, Chris. We normally start off with the electronics, so things that Chris has already done on the inside by turning on the cameras, establishing comms with us out here. Um, yeah, yeah, just. Um, we also will turn up all the depth sensors, the compasses, um, INS, which is the navigation system, um, and spin all that up. And then once all that is good, then the pilot on the inside will let the people on deck know that he's ready to start doing all the checks. So then we will then go with lights. And Chris, if you could come on with just turn on a whole bunch of the lights and then we'll come back I'll off. Turn them all okay. on. Yeah. That'd be cool. Yeah. So Sebastian has about 500,000 lumens. I know that sounds like a made up number, but it is actually that much. It actually just got hotter with all the lights on. Yeah, it's pretty uh, warm um, right there. That's all the different um, lighting that we have, um, what we would be checking to make sure that they're all pointed the right way, that they're all working properly. Um, after that, um, we will then go to the back. And the thrusters? Yeah. We'll okay. then make sure that this ball valve right here is open. Um, if not, um, it'll make a hydraulic lock in the system. Um, and once we say that is open, then we will give them the clear to all right, Chris, red ball valve open, clear, come up with HP. All right, now what I'm going to do now is I'm going to direct him. I'm going to tell him which way to go on the thruster. So what I'm looking for is the correct direction of the thruster spinning. I, I'll feel for air as well. So, Chris, go forward. But now I can feel an air blast coming towards me. That's him going, now come aft. Let's just spin that way. No air, air is being pushed forward. Now he's going to rotate port. I should get a change to get air this way, no air that way. Just spin in a different way than this one. Starboard. Likewise, port. Get air, no air. And then what we're going to do now is we're going to come on to the lateral. He's just going to push the big lateral that we have in the middle. Chris, lateral port. Lateral starboard. Likewise, we're checking the rotation and then vertical up and vertical down. And then we'll do the other way on the on the starboard side of the vehicle. We have a vertical thruster. Over there, and then Chris, vertical up, vertical down. Now, once hydraulics are done, I'll tell them to secure hydraulics so that way they don't have a run up, or if he accidentally touches something, they don't run. Don't want those to run in air for a long period of time. After he does that, I will tell him to, you know, come out with the suction sampler, we'll test the suction, we'll sit there, we'll rotate the index, we'll come in and out with the porch. When he comes in and out with the ports, we'll open up the bio boxes, check all them, and we'll check these. We call these um, our arms. So the rams. The rams. These will slide in and out. We have two D rubbers on here. So the reason for this is when we come up to a rock face, 
trip. Hold Sebastian on said rock face without using the porch, without putting the arms out to hold something. We can actually just brace ourselves on there and put a little thrust forward and it'll hold it and bring that in. And then, uh, you know, like we did with the science cam, we'll science cam in and out and tilt up and down with their sit cam. Sit cam stands for situation camera, that is correct, John. Yeah. Yeah. So it came up and then bio boxes? Let's do it. Just bio box two. And then if you wanna porch in, you wanna push it, come in high pressure. You'll push it so it's not so loud. Okay. So the only reason why we're pushing this is because uh, if we come on high pressure, it's extremely loud and the porch can't pull itself in and low pressure, which high pressure is around 3000 PSI and the low pressure is 500 PSI. Mm -hmm. And then and normally we would come into high pressure and um, operate the T4s, which we already did with that one. Um, so that would pretty much, that's a quick rundown version of a pre-dive. There's a bunch of little small tidbits that we actually do that just you know, saves us. You know, we touch the cables, we make sure all the connectors are good, check oil leaks, we make sure all the lens covers are off of the cameras, uh, SBL beacons are on, all stay on. Um, yeah, that's about it. Huh? Full, over, full over check. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, Roy asked. Go and kill it. All right, keep it on. Um, Roy asked if there's a swell wave limit to launch. Um, we like to put our limit at about um, two meters. Um, that's a bit of a gray area. Um, it's it's a, in combination with the currents and the wind speeds. So if we're seeing anything about 25 knots or more for wind speed, two meters swell and two knot current, we're, those are all big red factors for us. But if, if it's only one of them, he can sometimes make the call to be able to go ahead and do that. I was just making sure that we didn't have any feedback. So this right here is our control room. Some of these out the way. Oh, where J Rod's standing is the co pilot seat. This is where he's going to be logging stuff, turning on cameras, turning on lights. Sensors. Most importantly, in the T4. Well, uh, this is where we do all of our sampling. If you see, this uh, controller um, mimics the actual arm itself, so it has the exact same seven functions that I was talking about earlier. So everything we do with this controller, um, the arm will do. We can slow it down to where, um, to let's say 50%, so it takes 50% more travel um, to be able to operate the arm that much. Um, I currently, I like to run it in the 100% to get more of a idea of where my arm is and be able to, if you go nice and slow and do a sample, you should be able to just nice and easily come back to right where you left off. It is so. Yes, all of our um, all of our pilot um, telemetry is via one fiber. Um, this takes all of our 232 uh, communications, 45 communications, Ethernet connections, and then puts it onto a fiber, brings it up, then it gets taken out of the mucks and put back out into all of its different systems in real time. And then uh, all these screens you're looking at, we have a total of 10 cameras on Sebastian. And, and like J Rod just said. Um, Cameras have their own fiber as well. So each one of those cameras are strategically placed around Sebastian to give us that 3D feel of one thing to feel like we're inside the sub itself. Um, we have SD cameras to help out with, you know, getting the samples at one point at the suction jar. And uh, 4K, 4K is a direct feed so we can get real time when we're working with the T4. And then uh, we also have different programs open, we have different computers open, we have a sonar, we have an INS computer, we have the USBL computer, we have the, his, the MT's mapping computer to where we can see real-time mapping that we've already done. And, um, we have an aft camera that's looking on the aft back deck of the ROV so when we're flying, we can 
bring it into the to the ship because this is a free flyer. It's not a TMS. You actually got to fly Bastion in, bring it in, and then the guys will pick it up and bring it into the docking head. Nice. And there's there's quite a few screens as you can tell. Yeah. Uh, uh, Roy asked, how many people does it take to operate one dive? To operate one dive. Um, well, it's definitely, if you're just talking about for the ROV only, um, once we're in the water, we just have the pilot and the co-pilot, but for the full operations, I mean, we need a guy operating the winch, a guy running the winch, a guy uh, putting the uh, putting the floats on, and then we also have to have an MT in here running the our tracking um, system, running the, the live stream, and and of course, all the help from the deck department coming out, helping us also with the floats and our lines and hopefully the bridge. Um, it takes there. around seven or eight people, yeah. roughly, just to launch Sebastian into recover. Uh, when it comes down to flying, you know, like Jared said, co -pilot, pilot. And then MT helps us out with navigation. He helps us out with um, he or she helps us out with a bunch of few things over. Uh, how fast is Sebastian and how much current can it overcome? Uh, I, I would say um, Sebastian could probably go about two knots, um, but not for an extended amount of time, um, given um, you are dragging the cable along behind you and depending on what depth you're at, if you're at the surface, um, Sebastian will start getting hot pretty fast if you're giving it all she has. Um, so um, in all reality, we don't hardly ever go anything over about uh, 0.7 of a knot. That, that's probably the fastest we're actually ever going for operations. Um, and typically what you ever see on the YouTube would be something more of like um, maybe a point two. <laughs> really, really slow. Yeah, yeah. about, um, what is it? Uh, 2.2 meters a second. Point three, yeah, point three meters a point, second. Point two, point. Yeah, yeah roughly. And uh, current, let's say about a knot, half. That's not, it, not that's sustained. Half. That's sustained current. That's not those gusts like we've been seeing in the EU. Change on us really quick. Obviously, don't want to go into. And like Jared saying was with the umbilical when we when we have in the water we're constantly looking at this so this is Falkor here oh, this is the red ring of death this is the 50 meter zone we don't want to come inside of it when we're diving due to the fact that our umbilical like here called thrusters that will pop us up which is not fun It'll be a fun day for us but um yeah so we're constantly looking at this and then if i zoom out pretty far the only reason i'm doing this is because session itself is over here that's because this is zero position of sebastian on the map in the water because we're not in the water and sending up to the surface so this will actually say front the front of the sub this is the back of the sub and while we're flying we're constantly watching how far we're away from the vessel where the vessel is where sebastian's going over here i'll say an rov to launch and recovery now it's a huge number we normally keep that around 190 80 70. i'll we'll go into the 60 50 zone just for our safe well-being. Um, we do have a trick. If it's just a surface current of something that's above 0.5 and it's just on the surface, we can actually move the vessel um, at a constant pace mm -hmm. to make it seem as though the current was less that's than that. I guess maybe this segues well into Rob's question, which is what is the navigation accuracy at depth? We are going to let John answer that yeah, one. John, do you want to come in and answer that? <laughs> Higo, you want to switch video? Yeah, we can uh, We can do that. Sorry, we've got a, a camera with a gimbal on it, so even though the ship is rocking, there's John. it thinks mm -hmm. we're still. This is the cameraman, mm -hmm. uh, lead MT. I'm John. I'm one of the marine technics, technicians on board. Um, we don't have the screen up at the moment, but um, we use a USB-L system, Sonodyne beacons, um, the transceiver head that uh, is on a pole that goes down through the hull of the vessel, uh, and then it will send out an interrogating signal. 
hit the beacon, the beacon responds, and then we use the uh, phase differencing between the ultra short baseline USBL, the elements in the head um, that will be able to determine the angle uh, that it came from using phase differencing, and then the amount of time before uh, between transmission and reception, uh, we can calculate the distance that it traveled at. Um, and the accuracy that we get on that um, is kind of, it, it compounds itself from the GNSS or GPS uh, signals that we get, which we have up to eight centimeter accuracy with the, uh, the uh, directions that we receive from our CNAV system. Um, but then that kind of trickles down to our MRU from the motion of the uh, motion reference unit. So inertial um, kind of accelerometers uh, very high end so that we can tell the motion of the vessel because if you send out an interrogation ping and the boat shifts or rolls or pitches or heaves uh, and then the signal comes back and we're in a different orientation, um, then we need to be able to calculate that difference, um, which is all done uh, via the computer and the systems for the USBL. Um, and then the beacon itself, um, it's a function of depth. Uh, so the deeper we go, the less accurate it is, uh, but we can generally get within half a meter to a meter of accuracy in the waters that we've been working in here in uh, Australia. And the great thing is, um, obviously, to calculate the distance, uh, we need to, we measure the time, uh, we know the speed because we're using a CTD that's mounted on the vehicle. So as the as Sebastian goes down through the water column, uh, we measure the conductivity, the temperature, and the density of the water. And we can calculate the speed of sound through the different layers of the water column. So when the sound goes through, uh, we can calculate ray tracing of that sound, the path that it takes, because it isn't just a straight line. If it goes into a, a slower medium, it will curve one way. If it speeds up again, when the, de when the density increases, the deeper we get, it uh, curves the other way. Um, so we measure the speed. Once we get to the bottom, we upload a new sound velocity profile into the USBL system, and then that will increase our accuracy um, uh, far more than using something that we took a few hours ago or uh, from a synthetic profile or what have you. So uh, we really can get um, really good positioning, which is very important because when uh, the RV pilots collect a sample, we want to know where it was, how deep it was, and obviously the geo reference point and uh, and the time that it was taken in, um, and then all the other hosts of sensors that the guys have on the vehicle that uh, from pH to temperature, um, so we can put fluorometers on there uh, to find out how much chlorophyll is in the water, um, and then collect water samples and the niskins that they have on board there as well. So uh, a full range of, of sensors that we have. That's awesome. Um, we're getting so many good questions in and we're starting to run out of time. Um, I might have time for just a couple more. Nora asks, uh, what is the procedure you follow if a system fails? Is there a systematic redundancy to avoid the obstruction of emission? Uh, so if we had a dead ROV, hypothetically, we would obviously start paying in slowly. We won't have any kind of control over the sub, so we'll obviously have to maintain someone in here to monitor navigation to see where the sub is and we'll maneuver the ship to catch Sebastian in a way. Um, it's, it's really, it's a, it's a dance. It's a dance if we had a dead ROV. Uh, we have to have all the elements right, you know, the, hopefully the current's good, hopefully the sea state's good. And when we do, we do have something that comes up like that. Um, redundancy wise, I don't think there's, yeah, we'll do have redundancy on the positioning. Yeah, but... we, we do have the backup beacon that yeah. um, isn't on right now. But, um, well, just because we're not in the water. And that's actually the last time that we did have a dead ROV. That was how John was able to track it and tell us how far away we were from the vessel, mm -hmm. the speed that it was coming up, and letting us know how to adjust the speed of the vessel as well as our pan of the winch. And believe it or not, everything went really smooth. It was mm. perfect. Perfect. So, you know, when you, when you get those situations, it is stressful, but you got to remain calm and, you know, right. rely on people that you have. We're, we're all here professionally and got to rely on everybody's take on how to recover a dead system. Because it could be, it could be, could be bad. Having um, redundancies in um, ROVs that go this deep um, is a challenge. Um, we currently use five um, copper conductors going down a line of 5,500 meters, as well as six fiber optic cables, five which get used. And uh, double that to be able to have 
um, a full redundancy to be able to swap over if something bad happened, that would double our cable size, double our winch size, double the weight of everything, and not make Sebastian as nimble as we are. So you kind of lose some of your redundancies, streamline, make sure that you're using the best components that you can and maintaining them properly. Um, and I guess one final question, uh, if you could go anywhere uh, in the ocean, where would you like to go with Sebastian? We're already hitting the ticket items. <laughs> We're in the Great Barrier Reef. I used to say the Great Barrier <laughs> Reef. I guess uh, all that's left is the Antarctica for me. Uh, Mariana's was nice. I've, I've, we got to fly Mariana's Trench. That was awesome. That was a good, that was a great experience. Um, I would say Antarctica as well. I mean, yeah. that's the that's the only other place. I've been to the Atlantic. Yeah. I've been everywhere else. Let's, let's go to Antarctica. Let's do it. <laughs> uh, actually, maybe one more. Um, what is the most exciting moment you have all experienced? Most exciting moment. Uh, I, I know yours. Yeah. yeah um, maybe that's Fauna for. Yeah. Um, during one of the uh, recoveries um, in Ningaloo Canyon, um, we were coming up and. Normally, when we're coming up from deep, which I think that dive was over 3,000 meters was over deep. 3, that was our deepest one. Right? Yeah, and it takes it takes hours to come up. So pretty much everybody gets bored of being in here because it's a lot of blue water. And it was just myself and another scientist. And I like to look at little creatures as I come up and go down. And I came across a siphonophore that was roughly about 140 meters long um, in a really big spiral shape. At first, I just thought it was just really far, but as I kept trying to get closer, I realized it was just that big and it was just taking up the whole camera's um, view. And um, it was amazing. Um, all, all of a sudden, the control room just filled up with people and just sat there and flew around it for about half an hour, just taking in something that could possibly be the longest animal ever recorded in history. Um, that's still up for debate or verification. I don't know how all that's working out. Uh, you know, mine is, it, it changes, it changes a lot. Look at the other day, we found that Dumbo octopus doing a weird behavior. That was pretty neat. Um, let's say the, the prettiest, coolest thing I've seen was obviously Big black smokers and the Marianas Trench, huge, mm -hmm. looking like skyscrapers, sub sea, just blowing out this black hot smoke, mm -hmm. hot water, and you know it was, that was just amazing. Seeing the different colors, seeing the the um, animals that were living that deep, those four thousand plus meters, mm -hmm. and those creatures, seeing the Ivan, yeah, it was just it was amazing. That was like my eye opening, like in awe. Like I'd never knew that this was down here doing this. That was just amazing. Mm -hmm. We've seen upside down waterfalls, which oh, yeah, just those were wicked, mess huh? with your mind. I mean, and it's yeah. these shells that are just built up of mineral deposits and water that's flowing up from the center of the earth that is heated up to by the time it gets there about 350 degrees Celsius and dropping off all these minerals. And it makes these shelves in an under side down pool. But so hot when it comes out the side that temperature change makes it look as though it's a waterfall going up exactly. and it just it messes it, with your mind it messes with your mind it's <laughs> wicked especially when you're flying and you come under and you look up and you're looking at yourself through this mirror yeah. it's it's wicked we had some fun with that yeah uh man you two are both making me want to become an rov pilot now <laughs> <laughs> it's fun it is yeah. fun it's very rewarding very rewarding um, and I guess with that, we're going to close it out. Um, Cody, J-Rod, Chris, and John, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you to all of the Mate ROV competition participants for your amazing questions. Um, you can live stream our dives. When is our next dive, gentlemen? Hopefully tomorrow. 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 So if you want to watch J-Rod and Cody in action, you can live hours. stream one of our dives. Um, and please feel free to follow us on social media. We've got Instagram, we got Facebook, we got the YouTube. Um, and again, thank you all for participating. Um, and they can ask you. questions there as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. ask questions, shoot away. If you got more questions, save them up and ask us in a live stream. We'll be more than happy to answer. After a while, just staring and not talking. We like talking to people, so <laughs> let's get it. <laughs> Y'all have a good day. Thanks, Bye. you guys. On behalf of the Mate ROV competition, thank you so much. Tell Russ we said hello. 
<laughs> we'll do. We'll, tell, we'll We'll give our best to Russ. Oh, here you go. Yeah, wait. Here you go. Well, this is our background. Mm, it's not that one. It's this one right here. Yeah. There's Russell. <laughs> He's always with us. <laughs> He's always with us. <laughs> On board or not. I love that. Okay. Well, with that, we're going to go ahead and end this. Um, goodbye, everyone. <laughs>